Pencil Kings, 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 Pencil Kings. You're doing it because it's what you want to do, and you know you want to do it. And anything anybody else can say really doesn't matter to you. We're back. It's Pencil Games Podcast, and today we are talking with Alexander Benkita. Now, Alex is working on something very cool, and I think that you're going to like this because I know that there's a lot of people that want to tell their own stories, uh, but you're stuck, or there's like a roadblock ahead of you, and I think by the end of this episode, you're going to realize that those roadblocks that you think are stopping you from moving forward, they don't actually exist, like period. Like they don't, you don't even need to worry about them at all, but we'll, we'll get into that in a second. So Alex, to start off, why don't you give us a one minute overview of who you are and what you're doing uh, before we dive into your story? Sure. So um, what I'm basically doing is I run a comic book company called Fright Comics. And essentially what I was, I act primarily as a writer and a creator and just kind of involved with all the production of comic books that I create. But I am an artist. It's just that I'm so busy with you know working and other things in my life that I don't have the time to draw a full comic book. So I just write comic books and have other people draw them for me. And that's pretty much it. Okay. Well, and that's exactly what I think is so awesome. So we'll just start off right here because there's a lot of people who think that they – you know, they need to do all the steps. They need to be the best artist. They need to be the best writer. They need to be the best colorist. They need to know all the different tools. They need to know how to do typesetting or any number of millions of other things that might be on their mind. But uh, what I really like what you're doing is that you're you're the creator. Mm-hmm. And I think that's an important distinction. Um, but before we dive into that exactly, um, you you went to school to learn how to do comic production. And you were telling me that one of the most important things that you learned there was the whole process of how comics are made. So Mm -hmm. where most people think that they have to do everything, how are comics actually made, you know, in in your view? Um, Yeah, so I did, I went to uh, School of Visual Arts for cartooning. And basically, you know, you'll start, you'll have, I was fortunate enough to have teachers that were comic book professionals, and you start to really understand how the industry works. The way comic books work, you know, within the mainstream, of course, it's different. Um, and other places, but within, you know, mainstream comics in, you know, the United States and I guess Canada and I don't know what it's like. No, it's different there. Anyway, so the way it works is it's all divided up. So you have your penciler, you have your inker, you have your letterer, and you have your writer. And then in addition to that, you usually have an editor who's going to go through everything and then you're going to have somebody who's going to be involved in production. Their job is to make sure everything looks good before it goes to print or whatever. And then you're going to have, you know, people who are involved in the publishing aspect um, but that's more of the business side of comics. But primarily the way a comic book is made is you have a team usually of a writer, an artist, an inker, and a letterer. Now, you can certainly do all those things by yourself. But you know the reason why it developed the way it did is because it increases production speed and people start to get specialized in certain fields and they tend to get very good at them. So to the point where, you know, for example, if you're – an inker and you're always inking constantly and now to be fair most inkers can draw pretty well um, but if you're always inking all the time you're going to develop skills with your hands alone that other people simply cannot do you know and a penciler who pencils all day he's not going to have the skills to move his hand like that because it takes years of developing that so that's kind of where comics is interesting is you really do see this kind of division of labor and everybody is specialized in certain things it doesn't have to be that way, but part of the reason why I like it, honestly, is and I when I work with artists, I have plenty of artists that don't want to have other people ink their pencils. And the reason for that hesitation is if you don't have a good inker and you have good pencils, the inker will ruin your pencils. And good pencilers are very defensive of who's going to ink their work. So most pencilers you'll meet, who are especially starting out, they don't want other people to ink their work. But I always kind of press this point that – you got to realize that it's not just about somebody else inking your work. It's about speed. And if while somebody else is inking your pages, you can be drawing more pages in the second issue. The most important thing is to get the comic out. It's not 
for you to ink it. It's, it's for it to get done. And you should specialize in this area because that's your strength right now. And that's, that's kind of part of it too. So first of all, thanks for the breakdown of all that. And I think it's important to, there's so many things that I know I've tried to do in life, you know, start a video game studio, mm-hmm. make my own comics. You know, I did a comic strip for a while for a newspaper. Nice. Um, but I've always been the do everything yourself variety yeah. and just basically smash my head through brick walls. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of pain, but I get a lot of experience doing it that way. Yep. And I think it's important to that when you have access to somebody or just when you know that there's the thing that you want to do and you go and you talk to a few people and say like, how is this really made? Like, here's the thing that I want to do. How would I actually go about it? And I think that for a lot of people that I've talked with inside the Pencil Kings community, they just want to tell their stories. And so I feel that they're, they want to tell stories, but now they're inside pencil kings developing their art skills which is Mm -hmm. great but i sort of feel like they might just be better writing and then trying to find people who are their skills are already there and then working with them together to actually create something but i'm not sure how realistic that is because i'm not you know i haven't gone down that path so i i want to hear about how you came about like assembling the team to for building your comics because this is uh, i think there's a lot that we can learn from from how you've been going about this. Sure. Um, that's the hardest part. <laughs> it's everybody, not everybody, I'm exaggerating, but you'll often meet people who have ideas and they'll go, oh, this is really neat or I want to do X or I want to do Y or Z. And they'll just go up to somebody who's a good artist and go, oh, I'm going to sell you on my idea and then you're going to draw it. But then you have to look at it from the artist's point of view. You think they don't have ideas they want to work on? You know, it, it's you have to figure out a way. To, exactly. The, I think really what's important is, number one, this is going to sound really obvious, you have to be willing to pay people. Um, and you have to understand it from a business point of view. I think there's kind of this confusion or misunderstanding of the way a lot of creative people, especially people who want to be writers, look at artists. They look at artists as kind of um, like a tool for what they want to do and what they think. And that's okay if you really want to do that, but you got to understand that costs money. You know, if you want to go up to an artist and say, hey, I got this idea and I want to do X, Y, and Z, if you're not willing to pay them or you're not willing to pay them a decent amount, they're not going to do it. And that's really realistic. And then in addition to that, and this is a big, big problem in the comic book industry, is it's very common for people to come up with ideas and not fully understand where, you know, all the work that's involved in producing something and how much it costs and everything that's involved. They just are kind of having fun. And as a result of this, a lot of artists get burned by writers who are just kind of enthusiastic, you know, hobbyists or whatever term you want to use. They just want to make comics, but then they don't look at it from a business perspective and they tend to, you know, not pay artists or they mistreat them or they make the artists have to do all this work that's way too much. And then as a result of that, artists have a very, very, very big hesitation for working with anybody who doesn't have any published work or has no experience. That's just incredibly common. And I understood that immediately. Because right when I finished school, I was drawing my own comic and I did everything by myself. That was my plan. Just like, you know, what you were saying. I did everything, you know, and and then I got a little burnt out from it. And then I said, you know what, I got to really prioritize on, I got to work on other things. And, you know, I'm definitely going to continue to draw comics, but it's not a bad idea for me to hire somebody else to also draw other ideas I have while I'm drawing this comic. And that was kind of how I started it. And then from there, it got to a point where I found myself going, I really don't have the time to produce this at a speed that can really get things done. So I'm going to, you know, focus more on the writing side of this right now and on the side, continue to develop my art skills until I feel I'm at a point where I can draw at a speed that's acceptable, you know, and do what I have to do. And in addition to that, you know, if you're drawing a comic, and then in addition to that, you're working, and then in addition to that, you're writing and producing comics, it's very stressful. So, you know, at one point, something has to give. And, you know, and I think it's important to never, you know, if you're an artist, and, you know, that's what you want to do, don't stop doing it. I draw every single day, you know, but realize that that seven or eight hours you have on your free day that you want to draw for seven or eight hours, you have to devote a certain amount of that time to the comic books you're creating on the side or the comic books you're writing and producing. And that's important. But the first thing you have to do is you have to 
make it very, very clear to anybody who's willing to work with you, you are going to pay them, you're not playing around, you are very serious about what you're doing, and you are gonna see it through. That's so important. If you can't do that, nobody's gonna take a chance on you unless they're incredibly desperate. Okay, so I think that was actually a, a great point that I would like to dive into more. So when you say, you know, you have to show people that you're serious about it mm -hmm. and that you're willing to pay them, how, what do you feel is the difference or have you seen where people are, uh, you know, just to use your words, you know, playing around versus people who are really serious? I feel like if, actually, you know, I'm, I'm just going to let you take the reins <laughs> here. So what's the difference so that somebody who's listening, they could maybe self-evaluate and say like, yeah, actually, now that you say it like that, I kind of feel like this story that I want to tell, it's more of like, if it happens or it doesn't, it's not a big deal. Or maybe they're like, I'm the serious type. Like, I feel like now I can move forward with this. Well, I think probably a good indicator is the kind of person that you know, I, I have gone through so many hurdles with getting the books done that I've gotten done. I mean, I've been working on them for a long time. I've ran into every pretty much problem I could think of, but it got done. And that to me is just, you know, a testament of I want to do this. And whatever it is I have to do to get this done, I'm going to do it. You know, whatever obstacles I encounter, I'm going to go over them. If something goes wrong, I'm going to roll with it. I'm going to make this work. And if you start to come across like that to, you know, I think – and. I think to be fair, what was very helpful for me was I already was drawing comics on my own. And an artist sees that and goes, this person knows what it's like to be an artist and they know what it's like to make comics because writers sometimes they don't understand what an artist has to do to create comics. They're not respectful or maybe they're just ignorant of it, how hard it is and how much work goes into it. So. I think because of that, it was easier for me to attract people and they would see comics I was making and they would go, okay, you're you know, somebody who actually makes comics and you are committed to this and you claim you're willing to pay me. Let's take a shot on this, right? So it's really the artist. I feel the artist is really taking the chance on you because if they draw a bunch of pages and then you don't pay them, they're the one that gets boned because it takes a long time to draw a page versus I wrote five pages of script and if I wrote it really badly and sloppily, I could have done it in maybe 30 minutes. You know, so the artist is the one who's really taking the chance. So you have to make it as clear as you possibly can that you are understanding of that and you are not going to, you know, you know, I'm trying to think of a term, but you're not going to, they're not going to have a bad experience with you. And this is going to sound kind of weird, but you have to create an environment where the artist knows you are taking care of them and you mean what you say and you're going to do what you say. If they email you, you have to email them back, you know, within at least a week, right? Or, or, or sooner. You can't, you know, if an artist emails you and then you vanish for three weeks, that's going to make them uneasy and nervous. And it's, it's little things like that. You have to really create a environment where they learn to trust you and they, you know, have confidence in what you're doing and they know you're serious. And when, and what's funny about that is once you start to kind of get the ball rolling, and that takes, for me, it took years because I made a lot of mistakes. I did a lot of things wrong. But once you start to kind of get things moving and people begin to see that you're serious, you're willing to pay them, you're not joking around, you will actually attract very, very talented people to you. It is, it, it's night and day. It's, it's a huge difference. The moment somebody can see that you're working on something good, and they'll think to themselves, okay, number one, this person did X amount of issues with him. You know, they obviously didn't screw this person over because they're still there. And number two, if this person is willing to take a chance on them and they're actually able to get these projects finished, then this might be good for my career and I'm going to get money to make a portfolio basically or I might have a career here, right? And you have to really create that environment. That's super, super, super important. If you can't do that, you'll never get somebody to be willing to draw your book. Kind of reminds me of when we were building our game studio way, way, like years and years ago. Mm -hmm. So how how did you find these, these artists to work with? Because I feel like um, mm -hmm. I want to, I just, I know inside of Pencil Kings, there's the, like I was saying before, the people that are there, they're, they keep trying to improve their skills, improve their skills, improve their skills. Mm -hmm. But what they really want to do is tell the story. Right. So I feel like they might be able to just say like, look, 
you, you, like it's great that you're improving your skills. You can help. You can work with the artist. You can create storyboards. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things that you can do without yeah. needing to be extremely detailed. Yeah. But your main focus is the story. So how do you like bring these artists, or how did you find these people? Were they um, people that you knew through school, or is it like friends of friends, or were you hitting the pavement, or the you know cold emailing people? What were you doing? Uh, you really have to you know hit the pavement. Uh, you got to use the internet. Um, you know, there's plenty of forums you could scour for people. There are people out there who are looking for work. And you can put out ads saying, hey, I'm putting out this book. I need somebody to work with me, blah, 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 blah. Now, what I would definitely, definitely suggest people do is if you're looking for somebody to work on a book with you, pay them. Don't, don't do the thing. A lot of people do this. And this is usually a red flag that somebody isn't that serious. They'll say, well, you could own half of the intellectual property rights or you could own a certain percentage of what this comic's going to be worth. Okay, but that, that implies that this thing is, number one, going to get finished. And number two, it's actually going to come out. And number three, when it does come out, you're going to put enough money and marketing and energy into it that it's ever going to become successful at all. So if you don't tell people, I'm going to pay you, you know, they usually see that as an indicator that you're not that serious. If you're not willing to kind of put up your own money, then you're probably not that serious about what you're doing. And what kind of price range do you look at for like starting a comic book? Uh, I, because obviously if you're, if you're a, a, I guess like an established IP, you're drawing for Spider-Man. Right. I'm guessing that the rates are oh, different rates are than really when high. you're somebody s- starting out or it's like something new. I think people can appreciate that, like that somebody's serious, uh, and that I, I and I actually feel like that's how some of the instructors come to Pencil Kings. Like they realize what we're trying to do. We're right. trying to spread the the love of art and this knowledge. And we don't have ginormous budgets, uh, and but they're still willing to work with us, and we and we pay everybody. Um, but it's a it's a very like good arrangement. But just like a ballpark range for somebody, let's say like for me, I have a story I want to tell. I know I'm serious. I'm starting to understand all the steps that need to happen in the production. But now I'm I'm stuck with artists. But uh, I, I so I start to approach people. What are kind of the numbers that they would throw out to do a book that would that would kind of seem realistic? A few years ago, I would throw out probably a lower number, but I'm kind of learning now. If you can start floating into the triple digits per page, you're going to be way better off. Because what will happen is, and this is super common, you'll run into artists who will agree to work for you know essentially peanuts, nothing. And you'll think to yourself, oh, great, so I can get this whole book drawn for X amount of money. But that's not true because what will happen is halfway through the project, they'll quit. Because the money's not good. And they were just desperate for money at the time or they were desperate for exposure and they agreed to it. So my advice would be if you're not willing to pay triple digits per page, you're probably going to have to be dealing with a lot of BS. And if that's the case, you're going to have to do other things to offset the low rate. And in addition to that, my advice would be don't pay somebody until they're done. But now you're going to run into a problem because they're going to say, well, how do I know you're going to pay me? Right. So what a lot of artists like to do and I feel like when you're starting out, you're dealing with people who are like really eager and they're desperate to get, you know, paid for art and they'll work for and they'll work, I'll work for dollar a page, you know, they'll work for nothing. And quickly they begin to realize it's not worth their time. But mm-hmm. they'll never this is a weird thing you're gonna have to I don't know why it's just something people have to learn if they're gonna deal with artists or I don't know why it's way more common in the art community and the comic book making community anyway. People have to realize that whatever an artist tells you is probably not true and they're not being sincere about what they actually want. So, you know, I've had artists in the past agree to work for a certain amount of money and then, you know, halfway through the project, they'll ask for more all of a sudden. And I'll just say, well, I can't, you know, this is the price we agreed on. This is how much money I put aside for this. I can't turn around and start paying you more. And then they'll either walk or they'll start producing incredibly slow. They'll be producing a page a month or a page every three months, you know, uh, because they're doing other things on the side now because they need money. So you as a writer and producer have to cut through that and be clear, you know, what is it you need? And a good artist will usually be straight with you. Somebody who has been getting paying work is going to be straight with you. They'll say, this is how much I want to be paid. An artist who is starting out will not. And you need to kind of ignore that or call them out on it 
and say, okay, well, if this is the amount you're willing to work for, it's going to be this much in the end, and you're going to have to produce it at this speed. And if you can't do that and keep it at a certain quality level, I'm not going to pay you. And see how they react. And at the time, they might say yes because they're desperate. But then three, four months down the line, you're going to start getting problems. So my advice would be expect to spend triple digits per page. You might get it for less. You might not. And when I say triple digits per page, I'm talking about just the pencils. And then if you're going to pay for the inks, you're probably looking at a similar price range or more. No, that's not true. About so it's a, Usually pay the inker less than the penciler. But both combined pencils and inks, you're definitely passing triple digits if you actually want the project to get done quickly and efficiently and by somebody who's a professional. You're going to definitely run into people who will tell you things, you know, I'll do pencils and inks for $30 a page. Don't even bother. It's not worth your time because they're not going to do it. And if they do, it's going to be awful. Even if they have a good portfolio, it doesn't matter. And you as the creator and producer, when you become the person who's making the comic, you have to think of it, you're, you're the producer, you're the businessman now. And you got to look at it from that perspective and realize it's about money or something else and you need to fix it because they're not going to tell you for whatever reason. I don't know why artists are, I don't know, they're very kind of, some will tell you, but most will not. Um, I've had situations where I had somebody working for me once and I could tell they weren't happy by the way they were working. And then I just said to them, you know, if you get, you know, if you do X, Y, and Z on the next issue, I'll pay you more. And suddenly it got better. Right. But they don't want to say that. So you'll run into that. It's very common. So that would be my advice. You're going to be looking at about a hundred plus dollars per page. And you're going to be looking at, you know, depending on how many issues you want to make, it, it adds up. Right, twenty-two. A comic standard page is twenty-two pages. Standard size comics, twenty-two pages. So you're looking at, let's just say, let's be conservative here, and let's say a hundred dollars a page. You're looking at twenty-two hundred dollars, and you're definitely going to lose money when it comes out. There's no question. You're not going to sell, you know, a certain amount of. Wait, comic. wait, wait. I want to stop right there because you said you're definitely going to lose money. Oh yeah. When it comes out, and you're talking about being like the businessman aspect of this. And I think that's another thing that we really need to dive into right. and talk about. But why would anyone ever do this if you're just basically flushing money down the toilet? Like, Well, the logic is this, and this is kind of my attitude about it. You're doing it because it's what you want to do and you're seeing it as an investment into your future. Is there a really solid chance it's going to pay off? Maybe not, but that's what it costs to get things done and to even get to play this game. If you want to make your own comics and get good looking art, it's not cheap and you probably will lose money. However, when you do that and when you start to put yourself out there, it opens up the door for a lot of other possibilities. Other publishers will start noticing you, other creators in the industry will start noticing you. It, I look at it from this perspective. If an artist has to spend, let's just say, I don't know, Let's go by the, the whole Gladstone thing. 10,000 hours to become a professional artist where Marvel and DC are willing to pick up their you know, books and, and hire them. You have to invest the, your time in the same way, but you're investing it into working and getting the capital to pay that artist to get your foot in the door. Because the art is what gets you out there in the world of comics. Nobody wants to read a comic if they don't like the way it looks. So you as a writer have to look at it from the perspective of if this artist is going to sacrifice 10,000 hours of their time, I have to be willing to sacrifice 10,000 hours of my time in working to pay an artist and break out as a writer. Ah, okay, so I see. Now I'm really starting to understand. So you have to pay the money to produce the product. Yeah. And when you produce the product, your name is on it as writer, as creator, right. as editor, as like whatever you want to do. Right. And because of that, it's you know, it could turn into something big. Mm -hmm. It it could be nothing. But but it's like a finished product that you created and you put your name on, you're like, this, this is me. I did this. Yeah. I made this happen. I brought this into into the world, yep. and it's something that you can show people. Uh, you go to a comic convention, you can mm -hmm. show that to the biggest uh, publishers, yep. and you, you just don't know where what kind of opportunities are gonna come out of that, but I can say from my own experience, 
that people do see you putting in the work. They do see like, wow, this guy is really serious. And I think it goes back to what you talked about in the beginning. And now I'm having the light bulb moment and it's all starting to make sense. Um, and it's one of those things that I think that it seems really risky, you know, like the, what oh, you're doing, <laughs> my parents would, they would hate on me all, always. They would just be like, don't do that. Stop, stop it. Stop wasting your money. Stop doing this because they don't, they don't understand that what you're doing. It's not like, it's like you're playing this amazing game where you don't know what the outcome is. Right. When you go and sign up for the cubicle, you know what the outcome is. You get your 401k, right. you yada, 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 you advance, maybe you get laid off, you go to a similar company, whatever. But you're on the creative's path. And I think that, you know, I salute you for, for what you're doing. Um, it, it's just weird because I just intuitively think of it like that. I don't, I don't think to myself, you know, oh, well, look at this money I may be losing or look at this. I just think to myself, that's what it costs. That's the price you have to pay, whether it's you're sitting in a room and drawing all day. And, you know, I think that's something people don't think about is they think too much about the actual physical money element of things. They don't think about the time element of it. If you're drawing all day, that's an opportunity cost because now instead of drawing, you're not working. You're not developing skills that could be getting you a higher income. You're still paying. You're just not paying with actual money, but you're paying with time. And that's all, that's how you get money. You get money by investing your time and working. So either way you have to pay, but writers seem to think for some reason that they don't have to invest their time the same way an artist does. You do. You have to, you have to put in your time to get that money so you can pay that artist. You know, if, if he's got to sit around a room all day and draw, you got to go to work and pay him. Right. And just like an artist who invests all this time and energy into becoming a comic book artist one day, it's incredibly risky. And it might not work out. And then you could turn around and say, oh, well, you know, I didn't spend any money. Yeah, but you just spent 10 years of your life. How much money would you have had if you used that 10 years of your life to finance, you know, work on your career and make money and put money in the bank? It's the same thing, right? So that's, that's just, I kind of just think of it like that intuitively. I don't, I don't think about it. That's the price you have to pay. That's what it costs. And if you, and back to what you were saying earlier, and this is huge, is if you can put out a book that looks good and is finished and is coming out regularly, that sets you apart from pretty much everybody in you know starting out in, in comics. That's huge. Nobody does that. It's so rare. There are so many examples of people who only have a number one and they never get to a number two. But when you run into somebody who goes, yep, I got a four issue miniseries that's done here. I got this book that's coming out. The next issue is coming out at this time, blah, 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 blah. That is so rare. And what's funny about it is when you start coming across like that, which is what I've experienced in my own, you know, kind of path, you know, career path or whatever you want to call it. My road in this, you know, my journey, if you will. There we go. Some short I'm trying to find. What I found is that once I start going, I start, I go to conventions constantly. Once people started really seeing me and they always saw that every time I saw them again, you know, professionals, I was talking to anybody, I had more work and I had more stuff and I had, it kept going and it kept going. There was a whole other, you know, it, it brings you to a whole new level and people see that and they gravitate towards that. And then now, now remember what I was saying earlier about how an artist needs to be assured that they can take a risk on you. Publishers are the same way. A publisher needs to know you're going to get the job done and you're going to do it well. So the moment, you know, if, if for sake of argument, you're putting out all these books, a publisher starts to see you and go, well, that person is probably a good asset. We should, we should hire that person because that person gets it done. That person is putting their own money down to produce this work. That's the kind of person we want to hire. So you'll suddenly start seeing, and this is really, really, really common, is pretty much in comics, all the people who end up working at the big companies, not all, I'm exaggerating, but the majority of them start out producing their own books. The majority of the writers who suddenly are, you know, big writers at certain comic book companies, I can guarantee you they produced a book on their own at one point, out of their own pocket. I mean, even, um, I think it was Robert Kirkman, the guy who made The Walking Dead, he was, I think he was 40 grand in the hole before Walking Dead even came out. And then it did. And now, you know, he's a big thing. Now, granted, <laughs> That's not going to happen to everybody. But the point is, is that's just what you have to do to get ahead if you want to go the writer creator route. That's, that's what you have to do. And when you can start doing it and doing it well, you will totally stand out from all the people who aren't serious and aren't willing 
to it, I almost want to use the word sacrifice, but I don't consider it to be a sacrifice because you're doing it for your for what you want. But you are willing to, you know, give up on other things. If you're willing to say, you know what, I don't need that much money in the bank. You know what, I am willing to lose money. That's how bad I want to do this. That is huge. And that kind of attitude is what you need if you want to make it in comics in general. You need to have that attitude. And if you don't, then there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, you should be a plumber or something that makes money. You know, you should go that route. You know, it's, it, it, making comics is not a good business decision. You know, it, it can be a phenomenal business decision, but you're doing it because you want to do it and you love doing it and you're willing to endure the hardships because of the potential of what might come out of it. And mm -hmm. I think it's important. You have to be willing to accept that you could fail. You know, like you have to be comfortable with that. And if you're not, it's not for you. It's not. <laughs> and, that's, and that's part of it. Uh, one of the things that you said that I think was really important and interesting just to, to pick up on was the, the idea that almost everybody who's uh, a, a name now or a, somebody that other people look up to or aspiring writers mm -hmm. or creators, you know, in any discipline look up to, they were all making their own stuff. And, you know, I think of um, – Peter Jackson. Oh, sure. Peter Jackson, Lord of the Rings, uh, Spielberg, mm -hmm. um, Matt Groening with right. The Simpsons. There's so many examples of people who just did this for themselves to start. And you may never have even heard of their first projects unless you, you know, go in and look them up and, and specifically dig. Right. Uh, what you see is the big production. But they're able to get those big productions. They're able to get the fame and the notoriety mm -hmm. that I know that a lot of people, they want to have that. Um, you know, whatever it is, there's no, no judgment here. If you want to be famous, that's, that's fine. Nothing wrong with it. Um, <laughs> but wrong with it. They, they're all like really investing in their craft when nobody else would, they're investing in themselves yep. and they're finishing stuff. Yep. It might even, some of their stuff might even be really horrible. If you were to go back and dig up some of their early work, it mm -hmm. could be absolutely, absolutely terrible, but it doesn't matter. They finished it. And I think that's an important distinction that you have to reach the finish line. Otherwise nobody sees your work and you don't get to go to the next level. Exactly. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. If you can't finish something that you start, it's a big red flag. And it, it, it shows that you're not really willing to commit to something. And you need to. You need to be committed to do this. This is not, um, it's not a, it's not fun, you know, in that way. It's not, it's not a big game. You know, it's, it's hard. It's hard work. It's not rewarding um, a lot of times in a financial sense. But if it's important to you, you're willing to pay that price. Just like, you know, I don't like drawing every day. I don't want to do that. You know, I want to play video games. I want to have fun. I don't want to do that. But I understand that's what you have to do if you want to get better at art. And that's what I want. So just it's the same thing as if you think to yourself, well, one day I want to have, you know, a big house. Okay, are you willing to work all the time and not spend your money and invest it properly and save it? If you're not, then you don't get to have the big house. It's the same thing. You know, you got to be willing to make that investment into your future and yourself. And I think this is important. You have to really know, really know what you want and that you want it. And if you do, you're, you, you don't think about it. You just do it. And anybody around you who will say, you know, whatever, you're crazy, you're this, you're that, that just bounces off of you. It doesn't even matter because you don't think in the same way. It just it doesn't, it doesn't even phase you, you know. Because I think everybody's parents will turn around and – or whatever, loved ones, anybody will turn around and say to you, you're crazy. <laughs> like what are you doing? Why, why would you do this? Look, look at all this money you're losing and, and you're, you're taking a, a gamble here and, and this, this, this. And it's not something you could really fully explain to somebody. But I think if you show a level of commitment, you're doing it because it's what you want to do. And you know you want to do it. And anything anybody else can say really doesn't matter to you. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that once you have proven it and you've gotten to you know a few levels higher, mm -hmm. then those people who they weren't sure, like they just have your best, they they just don't want to see you hurt, right? right. So that's why they give you that advice. But once you start to show them like how serious you are, how dedicated, then they start to become your you know your huge supporters. Um, 
So we, we need to wrap up here soon. But before we do, I definitely want to talk about your books that you have coming out so that people can go and check them out because I was really impressed when I saw them. Yeah, um, thank you. I, I, did, I wasn't, I, you said you were going to send me some some issues and I really wasn't sure what was going to hit my inbox. Um, oh, but I, I was I, just I sent blown away. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought you didn't yeah, care I, for a second. <laughs> when you, no, no. When you, when you first said that you were sending it, I wasn't sure you know, like what the comic book would be like or anything, but I was just blown away. And so why don't you tell people a, a little bit about um, each book and it should be available by the time this podcast is released so people can go and check it out. So we want, definitely want to let them know where they can go and check it out as well. Sure. So uh, I'm putting out two books for, you know, I'm launching them in the middle of August. So I guess this podcast will come up in September. So the two books I'm putting out is I'm putting out a superhero comedy book I actually made with a buddy of mine called Champions of Earth. And I'm putting out, I call it more of a dark fantasy book called Captives. So, and what's funny about these two books is they couldn't be more different. So Champions of Earth actually was the first time I really sat down and got somebody else to work on my stuff. And I was very inexperienced and I didn't know what I was doing. And Champions of Earth was kind of a big learning step, you know, kind of a learning process for me. And I had a partner on it too. And that's really tough because <laughs> not everybody is on the same page as you. While I felt like I was way more into this than my partner was, I was the one that got it done ultimately. You know, like it was, I was the one that really pushed it through the finish line. I said, this has to get done. You know, that was really what I wanted. But what Champions of Earth is about is it's kind of a funny take on the superhero genre. So what it is, is that the, the main characters are these two teenagers called the Scarab and Jupiter Man, and they, they call themselves the Champions of Earth. They're these superheroes, but they're pop star superheroes. They're very popular. You know, they're on TV. They say just the right thing that everybody wants to hear, but it turns out they're actually liars. And as the story progresses, you realize they're full of it, and they're just saying whatever they have to say to get successful. And on the other and in addition to that, there are two other kind of legendary superheroes that were thrown in jail for crimes they committed. So now the story becomes about, you know, these superheroes that got thrown in jail, they kind of want to get revenge or, you know, they want the situation's got to be resolved by them ultimately. And the main characters are pretty unlikable and they don't have any kind of good characteristics. You know, at best, they're entertaining and innocent. And they have, you know, and that's what the story's about. So it's, it's kind of a funny take on the whole superhero idea. And then Captives is about, um, essentially what happens is, it's kind of a, it's a hard way to explain. It's a mythology story where basically this, these two young boys, they find out about this legend of this monster, and there's this princess stuck inside this, this castle. And if you kill this monster, then the princess will marry you. But it turns out that that princess has been there for hundreds of years. Everyone who goes inside this castle dies, and no one ever succeeds. So the two young boys, you know, one of the boys goes, well, I want to, you know, I want to save this princess and I want to marry her. And the other boy says, no, 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 that's a, you know, that's, no, the other boy is in agreement, I'm sorry. And then the father who's telling him the story says, no, you can't do that. That's horrible. That's, I don't want this to happen to you, right? You're going to die. And then as the boy grows up, he decides that's exactly what he's going to do. And he's completely obsessed. And then he encounters other warriors who are there for the same reasons. And this happens every year. And then the story follows this you know, boy's journey as he grows into a man. Well, he grows into a man and follows his journey going inside this labyrinth. And then his brother tries to stop him, but he gets dragged inside too. And then that's what the story's about. And the thing that's interesting about this labyrinth is that nobody really fully knows anything about it because no one has ever survived. No one's ever come out. So there's a lot of kind of hearsay and, and there's speculation. And there's actually one character who, through various forms of alchemy, is able to kind of see into the labyrinth. So he has somewhat of an idea of what's going on, but he actually assumes, he's, he's an old man, he assumes he's going to die. And he's actually just going in there because he wants to see it for himself. So every character has a different motivation for why they're there. And it's just the story is about kind of exploring this place and everything that happens. And I'm actually incredibly proud of the work that has been produced on Captives in particular because... The artist on it is just phenomenal. Uh, the inker is this uh, veteran comic book inker named Dan Parsons. I get along with him incredibly well. Super great guy. You know, I, I was I'm very very grateful that he was willing to take on the project. Um, and it's just it's just 
the, the covers are beautiful. They're painted by this one illustrator who's fantastic. I've gotten so incredibly lucky with that project in particular because of the people it's attracted and the people who kind of believe in it and are willing to, to just give me their amazing skills, you know, to work on it. Yeah, it sounds like a really cool story. Um, it's, it's kind of like I felt like I wasn't think, explaining it well, probably, but <laughs> no, I, I like I'm, I'm drawing parallels myself with like a little bit of like Hunger Games with Labyrinth mm-hmm. um, and like D and D. I don't know. It just feels like there's a lot, and there's a lot of ways that you can take it because it's nothing like the labyrinth isn't defined other than that it's a labyrinth, so you can turn it into whatever you want. And I think that's really uh, must be exciting for you to have be able to take it any way that you want. Well, I kind of have a very, I already know what the ending is. I have a very kind of set idea of what I'm doing. And what I really like about this story is that not all the characters are necessarily good people. Because you look at it from the perspective of what kind of people would be attracted to this kind of situation. So the main character, Simon, the boy who grows into a man, he is borderline, you know, I'm trying to think of a word for it. He's completely and utterly obsessed with this princess. He's obsessed with her. He, he sleeps under the tower where she is. He's so obsessed with her that he's out of his mind and he has to see her. And he, he's willing to get killed, to be with her. But he's so, he's so determined, he's so sure that it's going to happen, he doesn't actually think he's in danger. And then his brother is kind of the heroic character and he's more practical and he's a, you know, a warrior and this, may, this other character, Simon, is not. And he's trying to protect his brother, but then he ends up getting dragged into the situation. So the character of Robert, the other main character, he's kind of the good guy, all around good guy character. But then all the people that are they're surrounded with are very the majority of them are just kind of, you know, not really fish or fishy or evil, or maybe you don't really know where they stand. And it it's it makes it a very interesting story to write because you put people in a scenario where their true nature kind of comes out when it's put under pressure. Because, you know, they're in this situation where, first off, they're all against each other in a way. And that's what the first issue is about. The first issue, there's a lot of conflict because all the characters are kind of already making their point that I'm going to be the one that marries the princess. I'm going to be the one that gets the treasure. I'm going to be the one that does this. And you can see they're all actually against each other, right? And then there's another character who kind of unifies them. And then other characters are there for different reasons that have nothing to do with that. And they're kind of the neutral characters. So there's an old man who's the alchemist. He doesn't care at all about, you know, anything that anybody else is interested in. So he just wants to be there because he wants to be inside there. And he actually assumes he's going to die. And then you have another character who's a mercenary and he just wants money. And he doesn't care about, you know, saving this princess or doing this. So those are kind of the characters who are neutral. And then you have other characters who are just, there's another character in the comic. His name is Tor. He's a barbarian. He's a bandit. And he has a whole group of guys with him. And he's telling people very clearly, I'm going to do this. I'm going to kill you if you get in my way. And I'm going to be in charge. That's the way it is. And he'll threaten and get violent with anybody who opposes him. So it's, it's a very interesting, fun story to write. Because when you put these characters in an environment where there are no rules and nobody fully understands how it works. You know, there's another scene in, um, in the second issue where it's mentioned in the first issue, but you see it in the second issue where one of the, they get attacked by these monsters and Robert – the warrior character, he realizes that one of the monsters is actually a, a fellow, he's a, the captain of a guard. It's a fellow guard that went in there recently and never came back. So he died and turned into a monster inside of there. So now he's beginning to piece together what's going on and everybody is just kind of learning how dangerous this environment is. So it's a very interesting story. I think it's so cool that I can really, I'm just sitting here listening to the pace of your voice and I can really feel the passion that you have for this project. And I think it goes back to one of the earlier questions that we had in the interview about, you know, the difference between, you know, am I serious or am I uh, just playing around? And I mean, it's, it's a question that we all have to ask and, and ask ourselves and answer for ourselves and decide, you know, if I'm ready or if I'm willing to, to endure what it actually takes. Because I think that, you know what, you might find that your big creative project that you have, your, your big story that you want to tell and you realize, you know what, I'm actually not that serious about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not going to make it a, like, not, not for you, but I'm, I'm speaking to other people yeah, who are uh, just listening, but you know what, I'm not that serious about it. I, you know, I'm going to try just writing it. I'm just, I'm not going to have to worry about any of the art stuff. I'm just going to write it and I'm going to see what happens with that. I'm going to s- send it around and, uh, s- 
you know, it's, I feel like it's an easy way to do something, to still finish a project, mm -hmm. uh, that you wouldn't have to necessarily, uh, invest so much or, or, yep. you know, risk so much. You wouldn't have to deal with all these people. Right. But if you want to go the comic book route, I don't think there's any other way around it other than what we've just been talking about for the last, you know, 40 minutes or so of how it actually works. So it, it's really up to you, to, you know, to decide for yourself if if you want to if you want to make it happen or not and because you can you can make it happen it's not out of anybody's grasp and Definitely I, th not. I think you know when you were saying that kind of the passion i have about it you know i don't again i don't think about it um but what's really interesting and this is something that is actually really exciting about when you hire somebody else to work on it is when they become passionate about it you see what they add to the story you know so for example robert um, the name of the penciler is Robert. I can never pronounce his last name, so I'm not going to try. But um, he brings something to that story that is so unique. And sometimes he'll actually change scenes in the script, or he'll modify them slightly. And I like them. Or it's, he'll, he'll take on a, a perspective I don't really see. And there's something of when a story I feel like has that going where everybody is really kind of into it. And the uh, Dan, the anchor, he really loves inking in and working on it. And you just kind of get this thing that really matters, I feel, to the people who worked on it. And it's, it's, so, it's so important to them that they're willing to, you know, spend their money on it and give their free time up for it and, and be okay with it failing and, and all these things because that's how much they like it and care about it, you know? And... Um, it's just wonderful. You know, it's, it's something that you can't, you can't buy that feeling, I think is the best way I could put it. You really can't. It's, it's something that's kind of extraordinary. Um, so that's the good side of it. You know? All right. Well, I think that's a perfect place to wrap. Uh, why don't you throw out your URL where people can find you, Alex? Um, sure. So my website is frightcomics.com. I literally put it up, I think yesterday. So, um, and on the site, there should be a link to download it digitally. And in addition to that, um, if you shoot me an email at uh, alexanderbankita at frightcomics.com, or I'll probably put it on the site. I do have issues I printed up for, um, I'm going to be at Wizard World Chicago. But by the time this airs, that would have been over. So I, will, I, might, I probably will have issues left over that I printed, and you're more than welcome to buy those as well. So yep, just go to frightcomics.com and you can get to me on there. Just use the contact page. I'll be there. And in addition to that, I do have Facebook, but I really haven't started the social media thing yet, but I probably will. So, but yeah, just for now, frightcomics.com, that'd be the best way to kind of find my stuff and you can get in touch with me through there. Awesome. And as usual, we'll have show notes from this over at pencilkings.com slash podcast. If you're looking for more interviews, we've got a ton there. We're over a hundred now. So little, uh, you know, hat tip to us that we're, we're, we're keeping at it. And uh, thank you so much, Alex, for hopping on the podcast and really educating me. And I think <laughs> for a lot of people about what it takes to, to go down the comics route, because it's something that so many people want to do. And I, I feel like there's so many uh, beliefs. The big one being that you need to be the guy that does, or the girl that does uh, absolutely everything. And right. it's just, that's not the way that the world actually works. It, it can work that way, but you know, most of the time that's not. And everybody has their specific job, so you just have to figure out where you fit in in that. And then, uh, you know, follow your passion. Yep. So thank you so much. Don't demand patience, skill, years of practice. Ah, you talk like a fool. I would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration.